Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us here tonight. I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Andrea Mayhew. I'm a second year master's student in the School for the Environment and Sustainability, studying sustainability and development. I focus on advancing economic development and clean energy strategies. I'd like to start tonight with a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that the land we stand on now was obtained through an 1817 land transfer from the Anishbak, the Three Fires people, as well as the Fox, Peoria, and Wyandotte. We further acknowledge that our university stands, like almost all property in the United States, on lands obtained generally in unconscionable ways from indigenous peoples. In addition, our research on environmental science and sustainability has benefited from and continues to benefit from access to land originally gained through the exploitation of others. Recognizing this does not undo history, but it is an important step towards the creation of an equitable and sustainable future. At SEAS and at the University of Michigan, we're continuing to partner with indigenous communities to advance sustainability together through important and impactful work that centers on justice and helps us create a more sustainable world for all. I am so excited about our speaker tonight because he understands that to solve the climate crisis, we must create solutions that work for all, not just a few. To address global poverty, we must address the climate crisis. Last summer, I saw the impact of this firsthand. I spent several weeks in Malawi to assess the adoption and impact of solar home systems on rural households. Many of these homes did not have access to electricity and through solar were able to access lights for the very first time. It truly underscores the importance and profound impact of this type of work. That is why it's my pleasure to kick off today's event. First, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Dr. Jonathan Overpeck, or Peck, as he's known. Peck is the Samuel A. Graham Dean of the School for the Environment and Sustainability, SEAS, at the University of Michigan. He has served as Dean of SEAS since 2017 and is the William B. Stapp Collegiate Professor of Environmental Education, as well as a Professor of Earth and Environmental Science, and a Professor of Climate and Space Science Engineering. An interdisciplinary climate scientist, Peck is an expert on climate change, climate vegetation interactions, earth history, environmental science, and sustainability. He has authored over 220 publications and has been referenced over 50,000 times. He advocates both scholarly and real world impact, particularly the need for public higher education to emphasize both. You'll see him frequently quoted as an expert in major news outlets like the New York Times. Peck has an active climate research programs on five continents, focused on understanding drought and mega drought dynamics and risk. He served as a working group coordinating lead author for the Nobel Prize winning Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Fourth Assessment. Also of particular note are his contributions to a study that defined the now widely used term mega drought for the very first time. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our special guest tonight, Dr. Raj Shaw. <laughs> Dr. Shaw is a president of the Rockefeller Foundation, a global institution with a Michigan, sorry, with a mission to promote the well-being of humanity around the world. Last fall, Dr. Shaw published Big Bets: How Large-Scale Change Really Happens where he shares a dynamic new model for realizing transformative change, inspired by his own work and that of the foundation on some of the biggest humanitarian efforts of the 21st century. In 2009, Dr. Shaw was appointed by President Obama to serve as the 16th administrator of the US Agency for International Development, where he reshaped the agency's operations in more than 70 countries around the world by elevating the role of innovation, creating high-impact public-private partnerships and focusing U.S. investments to deliver stronger results. In addition, Dr. Shaw secured bipartisan support that included the passage of two significant laws, the Global Food Security Act and the Electrify Africa Act. He also led the U.S. response to the Haiti earthquake and the West African Ebola pandemic, served on the National Security Council, 
and elevated the role of development as part of our nation's foreign policy. Prior to his appointment at USAID, Dr. Shaw served as Chief Scientist and Undersecretary for Research, Education, and Economics at the U.S. Department of Agriculture, where he created the National Institute for Food and Agriculture. Previously, Dr. Shaw served at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, where he created the International Financing Facility for Immunization, which helped reshape the global vaccine industry and save millions of lives. Dr. Shaw was raised outside of Detroit, Michigan. He's a proud 1995 graduate of the University of Michigan, where he received a Bachelor's of Science in Economics before earning degrees from the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine and the Wharton School of Business. Dr. Shaw bleeds maize and blue and stays connected to U of M by serving on the board of the Alumni Association. Let's give a warm Wolverine welcome to Dr. Shaw. Well, it's wonderful to have you here with us today. Um, thank, thank you for you, coming. It's great to be with you. Yeah, and I think everyone should know that, uh, was it today or this week, your son learned that he got into Michigan? Uh, we, <laughs> <laughs> we just have to make sure he comes. All right. Because it's important that he learns that he can walk anywhere in the world <laughs> and people will say, go blue. Go blue. When you're wearing your hat. Yeah, it's, it's wonderful. But I also want to thank you because I think you're the kind of game changer that Michigan can be incredibly proud of. And in this discussion, I hope we can uh, learn a little uh, for the audience, particularly the students in the audience, but others who are looking to really change the world. Um, clearly, we have some problems in the world uh, that need to be solved. And this is a person who has worked very hard and has been successful in solving some, you know, working towards solving some of the biggest. I'd like to start off by talking about your time in the Gates Foundation, um, which preceded your time in the Obama administration and preceded your time at Rockefeller, um, when you uh, helped develop a international finance facility for immunization. And back then you were um, trying to uh, do something about the fact that a lot of children around the world were dying simply because they didn't have childhood vaccinations. And somehow early in your career, you figured out that, boy, we better do something about that, and you, you did something about that. Um, and then, of course, uh, you did these other things. Um, but wherever you're going, you're thinking about bold actions. Um, you joined the Rockefeller Foundation, and it all the money in the Rockefeller Foundation started with oil. And I don't know how many times I've tweeted that, you know, oil companies should be paying for the climate crisis. <laughs> but you have uh, taken their money and put it to great purpose. Um, and I wonder if you could just uh, help us think, uh, you know, get in your mind about how you think through and develop these large-scale, impactful plans and then launch them into effective, sustainable initiatives. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Peck, for having me, and thanks for your extraordinary career in leadership on climate change. You know, this is one of America's treasures when it comes to understanding that climate change is an existential threat to each of us and our planet, and uh, it's really an honor to get to be with you. So, so thank you so much. Um, I also want to thank Andrea for that kind and overly generous introduction. But isn't she so cool? She's a graduate student here and is going to make great things happen in the future. Um, and thanks to everyone for coming out in the snow. I'm just excited to be here. Being on <laughs> campus after a national championship uh, and a snow day is like super cool for me and very, very exciting. So uh, it's great to be with you. You know, I think, I think, Peck, you're asking a question that gets to the heart of why I wrote the book, Big Bets. And I wrote the book because I feel like often we look at climate change or widespread human poverty or 800 million people going to bed hungry tonight, uh, or even in our own country, these deep inequities that hold so many communities back generation after generation after generation. And we say to ourselves, maybe not verbally, but quietly, we say to ourselves, gosh, those, those challenges are too complex. They're too they're too overwhelming. I'm just 
one person. I'm just one student. I'm just one professor. What can I do to really make a difference? And it allows us to fall into what I call the aspiration trap, where slowly over time, we just stop trying to solve these problems at scale. And, you know, I grew up outside of Detroit. I came to Michigan and loved it, loved it, loved it here. Uh, but I didn't really know what I was going to do with my life. And I, but I knew I wanted to be involved in social service, and we can talk about why I knew that. But I had no idea how to get going. And one thing led to another, and I landed in a wood-paneled conference room that was dramatically oversized, sitting opposite Bill Gates with a group of experts around the table. With Bill, not, not me, I was, the, I was basically the intern. I had a very glorified title of chief economist, but there were no other economists there. <laughs> I was the intern. And uh, with Bill asking the question, what does it cost to vaccinate a single child? And the reason he was asking that question was because he and Melinda had read a newspaper article a little while earlier that said 600,000 children were going to die of a disease called rotavirus. How many of you have heard of rotavirus? OK, good. By the way, all of you have had rotavirus. We've all had it. But we don't die in this country from that disease. And at that time, this was 2001, 2002, Merck was about to roll out a vaccine that would only be available to insured communities, privately insured communities in the United States. And, and Bill and Melinda just said, why, if there is a vaccine that either exists or could exist that would save all these lives, why would it only be available to effectively the richest country in the world and the slice of people in that country that have access? And it wouldn't do anything to help reduce the 600,000 deaths. And so they made a commitment that every child and every life should have equal value, and we should figure out how to make sure every child born on this planet got all of the vaccines that could safely reduce the risk that they would die of preventable diseases. Uh, and, and the ch first chapter in the book is called Ask a Simple Question, because the way we broke through the complexity, the first time Bill asked the question, all these experts who I learned so much from said, well, you can't really think about it that way. It's too complex. You know, you need roads. You need refrigerators. You need power and electricity. You need financing. By the way, the vaccine industry doesn't even have enough supply to, to serve the 50, 60 million kids that are not getting vaccinated every year in low-income countries. So you'd need a vaccine manufacturing base. And uh, it just was always too complex. And the power of that simple question allowed us to create the models, do the analytics, the same things you were doing if you were in private equity buying a company. You would study it to death and, and model it out. In the same way, we, we studied to death the issue, modeled out the cost, ultimately understood what the barriers were, uh, and did some really unique things as a global community of, of organizations, not uh, Bill or the Gates Foundation alone, but acting together. And 20 years later, 980 million children have been vaccinated. And 16 million kids who would have perished have survived. And that kind of impact, <laughs> thank you, that kind of impact taught me that big bets are possible. That we, we should, in this work, uh, call it what you want, but we should aspire to solve and not just make incremental improvements on the problems we face. That's amazing, and <laughs> thank you for clapping. You know, I've, over the last couple of days, I've tried, I've read the whole book, and um, it's a mindset that you've developed for making big bets. This is just one of your first big bets. Um, I don't know if you want to mention a couple others, but I want to get in your head and understand what a big bet mindset really is. Yeah, so big bet mindset, you know, it starts with this bold, audacious goal, like, like vaccinating every child. Uh, but I think there are three core components to a big bet that I try to ask our partners at the Rockefeller Foundation, our teams around the world, to think through. The first is, can you identify fresh and innovative solutions to the problems we face? You know, whether it's climate change or diarrheal disease, uh, there are our <coughs> capacity to innovate new solutions, especially on a campus like this one, a massive research university that just has excellence in, in everything we touch. 
is, is unbelievable. Uh, so often, instead of just thinking about what people have been doing for decades, I ask folks to innovate and develop fresh new solutions. The second part of a big bet is really bringing together unlikely partners and bedfellows. And uh, some of the more fun stories in the book, I think, are about trying to get Republicans and Democrats working together, which we did to pass uh, something called the Global Food Security Act, which reinvigorated America's capacity to fight hunger around the world. Uh, but the way you get there <laughs> is not the spreadsheet analysis that you know, I learned at the Gates Foundation. It was the closed door uh, dialogue and building relationships based on sharing your values and your vulnerabilities with people you don't know and people with whom you probably don't share a lot of commonality. Um, but those relationships allowed us to do something transformational for America's role in the world fighting hunger and food security. So that's the second component of Big Bet. The third component I think is probably the most important and it is being absolutely determined and rigorous about measuring results, seeing what works, what doesn't work, and course correcting, which sort of sounds uh, super obvious, but if you, you know, that when we started that immunization project, the official UNICEF data would say that 70% of kids were getting vaccinated. But when you kind of really dug deep and analyzed it, that was probably overstating by 200% the reality. Um, and that's 30 million kids, you know, that are, are left behind if you believe that data that wasn't accurate. Uh, similarly, when we fought back the Ebola crisis in West Africa, which was a hemorrhagic fever that the CDC ex estimated would lead to 1.4 million cases, including tens, potentially hundreds of thousands of cases in Europe and the United States, we beat it back to 30,000 cases, only two in the United States, no transmission on this soil. But the story of successfully fighting the Ebola pandemic was one of investing in data putting bioterror labs across West Africa to rapidly confirm a possible positive diagnosis, putting students and young people on motorbikes to go do visual confirmation of potential cases of hemorrhagic fever, collecting that data quickly and posting it so the world could respond. So often when we do this work, we're not quite as uh, serious about the, the data element. I served in government for seven years, so I can say that with real experience. Uh, when we are, we have a capacity to do things that most people don't appreciate can be transformational. So now we've heard you're vaccinating most of the, just millions of kids, tens of millions of kids that wouldn't have been vaccinated. You help beat back Ebola. So we gotta, we just gotta keep track of all the things this guy has well, done. Well, I will say these are, these are team efforts. You know, the, I, the big bet on Ebola uh, do you all remember the Ebola crisis in 2014? I get to do some things in high schools now and I ask some of these questions and, and uh, folks were so young when that happened that, that you don't know. But the Ebola crisis, when it really exploded in the summer of 2014, uh, seven out of every 10 people that contracted that disease died. Seven out of 10. 50% of the Liberian healthcare workforce perished in about eight weeks in June and July of 2014. Uh, it was so bad that we couldn't even, I would call around and ask humanitarian organizations to, to surge in. We couldn't surge in because there weren't enough protocols and protective equipment and knowledge and protection to actually keep workers safe. And it was in that context that President Obama, not me, made the big bet. And for the first time in American history, deployed 3,000 US service personnel to fight a disease. And he did that 10 weeks before a midterm election. He did that at a time when uh, political leaders from, uh, from the right, you know, we were obviously a democratic administration, including a, a new voice on this stage, President, not at the time, not President Trump, but Donald Trump, was out there saying, you know, we should end flights to Africa. We should quarantine people who were flying in uh, from, from Africa. We should uh, simply try to isolate ourselves and not go anywhere near that disease. And had we done that, we would have been overrun by that pandemic on a at least regional, if not global basis. And, uh, and the president made the bold call to, to go in and do the right thing in the face of extreme political risk. You know, imagine 
losing any U.S. service personnel, which would be tragic in any setting, but to a disease in West Africa. Would have been an uh, unheard of uh, disaster. So, you know, but they went in, they built some infrastructure. We ultimately uh, put that data system in place that I talked about. And then we went to local communities and we said, what do you all think is gonna work and not work? And it turned out people were contracting the disease primarily by honoring those who had died. They would wash the bodies, they would redress the bodies, they'd perform a ceremony, they would hug and kiss loved ones who died, which is custom. And, uh, and then they would contract the disease. So they worked with the World Health Organization and others and developed these burial team strategies with four or five people in protective equipment, body bags, to put the bodies uh, safely in a bag, then do the ceremony, then remove the deceased from the setting. And we saw transmission go down 70% almost overnight. And when I visited in October of 2014, uh, I got back to the US and went on CNN to kind of explain what was happening in Wolf Blitzer. Uh, who was courageous for putting me on the set? <laughs> you know, he was like, he's like, Raj, everyone here is nervous. <laughs> you, you are a risk to all of us. Uh, and uh, I said, well, if I, I'm, I'm safe, I promise, I'm safe. <laughs> but the fear and the panic was high. Uh, and my kids' friends were like, is Raj coming to the soccer game this weekend? Because <laughs> we saw on the news he was, in, uh, he was fighting Ebola last week. And so, so anyway, the, the reason I say that is, these are not any one person's big bets. Right. They are bold leaders, uh, bold decisions that are made possible by you know, President Obama at the top and a local group of uh, community organizations called Global Communities way in rural Liberia that kind of invented the solution that made the difference. So if partnerships are a big part of this, um, we have a common friend, um, and I say use that term loosely, um, because in your book you talk us about a story when you're trying to feed some of the most few food insecure people in the world, in Africa and elsewhere in the global south. You were able to actually build a bipartisan consensus that we needed to do this. And one of the senators you worked with, you talk, talk in a story about getting out of a van and pushing a van through mud with him is uh, Senator Inhofe. And Senator Inhofe is famous in the climate community because he's the guy who would, in winter, bring a snowball into the, into the Senate chambers and declare that climate change is a hoax. And his staffer, Mark Morano, would be out on the, the um, mall building snow forts and things, I guess. Um, and I had quite a bit of jousting with him in my career. He did not like me and my colleagues. And I think it's amazing, though, that you were able to build a consensus with this very conservative gentleman and some of the other um, members of his caucus uh, to feed people who really needed the food. And could, I wonder if you could say a little about that experience, not with Senator Inhofe so much as what you were able to accomplish together in a bipartisan way when Partisanship was a big thing, like today. Yep, partisanship is still a big thing. Yeah. Isn't it? It's maybe even more uh, dramatic today. You know, in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis, uh, and this was less visible to many Americans, but there was also a, a concurrent food crisis. And what we saw as a small spike in food prices in the U.S., actually had the consequence of pushing about 100 million people back into poverty in many parts of the world. And in, around then, The Economist ran a cover story with a young girl in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, eating mud cakes. And, and, um, and I was like, what's a mud cake? And a mud cake is exactly what you think it is. It is grain mixed with mud, so kids get a little more satiety when they are very, very hungry. And so, again, to President Obama's credit and Secretary Clinton was, was Secretary of State, uh, when, when the administration came together, we said, look, we're gonna, we're gonna bring the global community together to deal with the global financial crisis. Uh, it is also an opportunity to deal with the global food crisis. And we launched an effort uh, called Feed the Future. It was designed to reinvest in agriculture in countries that were willing to make certain types of policy reforms in order to help uh, reinvigorate the fight on hunger and malnutrition in that setting. 
and to do some other things like reform the way we provided food assistance around the world. And you know, right about when that program started getting going and working, and we had about 20 other, we used the G20, uh, which is a, a negotiation with heads of state of the 20 primary economies, to launch that effort and raise billions from others. Right when that started getting going, uh, we lost the House. <clears throat> and, uh, and the first bill of the Republican Congress in 2011 was a bill that zeroed out the program and also zeroed out the agency I ran, USAID. And so I kind of did all the analysis, had the team do all this work, and I was like, guys, we're going to go fight for what we do. And I went up to Congress and testified. And in my testimony, I explained how shutting down our programs would lead to 70,000 kids dying. And I detailed it out, malaria, mother-to-child transmission from HIV AIDS, a bunch of other malnutrition programs, very technical and accurate. Uh, and I got back to my office and started getting kind of some congratulatory calls, one from the White House being like, about time somebody said how crazy this budget is. Uh, and then my a mentor and friend, Tom Vilsack, called. And he was Secretary of Agriculture. He still is Secretary of Agriculture. And he's, he's great at that job. He, uh, he called and he said, Raj, I was just with Speaker Boehner, and he's, he's upset with you. And I said, well, I don't know Speaker Boehner, so that's not good that he's upset with me. Uh, but he said that he's spent a lot of time trying to build a humanitarian consensus amongst conservative Republicans for this work. And your comments were disparaging and upsetting to them, and, and now they're going to be less likely to try to fix this. So he's like, come, on, come up and, and meet him. So I went up, met with the speaker, and apologized. Uh, met with his chief of staff, a gentleman named Barry Jackson, who gave me a list of, of members to meet. One was Jim Inhofe, a senator from Oklahoma. And he said, these are, these are all members who are very conservative. They, they probably don't agree with much with the Obama administration. Um, but their faith and their uh, willingness to commit to their faith makes them inclined to want to support food, hunger, water, and humanitarian efforts around the world. So over time, I got to know uh, members of Congress. We'd close the doors. We'd hold hands. Some cases that we'd pray together, share our values. Uh, not something I was as used to doing, uh, but it was a way to get to know people that came from very different places. And ultimately, Senator Inhofe and Chris Coons and a whole group on a bipartisan basis passed the Global Food Security Act. That act codified these programs that, that over about seven or eight years moved 100 million people back out of hunger and poverty in a sustainable way. Uh, that bill has been reauthorized under President Trump it, on a bipartisan basis. It was passed again under Biden, and it was used to implement something called the Black Sea Grain Initiative, which was a negotiated settlement with Russia and Ukraine to get Ukrainian grain into parts of Africa during the last cycle of hunger and malnutrition. So I tell that story because that legislative framework allowed America to re-establish itself as the world's humanitarian leader. And I believe American leadership in that context is hugely important because others follow our example. And I, I really believe, in my heart of hearts, you can build these kinds of partnerships, public and private, Republican and Democrat, uh, but you have to make it personal. And that, that's the lesson in the book, and the lesson I learned was make it personal. And build partnerships. And build friendships. And, and friendships. friendships, trust. Yeah. yeah, that's great. I want to turn over to uh, audience questions, which we got in advance. But right before I do that, I want to ask you one sort of fun question, and maybe it's not so fun. What keeps you up at night these days? Uh, well, what keeps me up at night a lot probably... Uh, more than, uh, more than it should, because I told myself I'd learn how to meditate, and that would help me with the staying up at night, and I haven't quite gotten there. It works. There. I haven't gotten there yet, yeah. so you'll have to teach me that <laughs> later. But that's my goal for 2024. Uh, but, you know, what really, uh, our, our foundation is very focused on climate change, because, you know, we believe climate change is the largest existential threat to the human condition, and we believe even if the world achieves a 2.5 to 2.9 degrees Celsius warming, which may be the trajectory we're on in various optimistic cases, uh, but you'd be the expert at that, that that basically unwinds six decades of 
progress in human development. Um, the global hunger goes up from 7 or 8% of the global population to 14% of the global population in 15 years. Uh, the number of people that are dislocated as climate refugees and migrants goes up into the hundreds of millions. Uh, access to food for entire parts of the world that are arid uh, goes down by 30 or 40 percent, yielding huge amounts of uh, political instability and strife and migration pressure and, and conflict. So, you know, to me, as someone who's spent a lot of time working on fighting poverty and hunger in developing country contexts, the climate threat, even if we succeed at achieving a trajectory that, you know, is kind of Paris plus reality, uh, is is hugely destabilizing for billions of people. And, and so that doesn't actually keep me up at night, but it, it is the direction of our foundation. We've made a commitment to divest from fossil fuels in our endowment, as an endowment, as you pointed out, that comes from Standard Oil. We thought that would be an important signal to send to the rest of the world and to our peers and partners. We've made a commitment to operate in a net zero way by a certain time and date in terms of both our endowment and our operations. And we've committed a billion dollars of our program resources to building the kinds of partnerships that we write about in the book to address energy poverty with renewable electrification, to restructure food production in a way that allows more carbon sequestration and less uh, carbon emissions, and to rethink how we build health and financial systems in a way that actually fights the climate change threat we all face. That's great. You know, and most of our audience questions have to do with climate change. Yeah. So you made that pivot very nicely. Excellent. And I know another one of your big things is how to pivot <laughs> and how important it is to pivot. Yeah. Um, you know, and I just have to sing your uh, laurels here. Once again, uh, I think when you were, um, when COVID hit and what you were able to do to get people focused on testing and to accelerate our ability to test. And we both had kids in school in those days, and we wanted to get them back into school. Kids at home. I mean, yeah, yeah, right. They were at home then, but we wanted to get them back into <laughs> yeah. school, right. Yeah. Um, so that was great. Um, but I think we want to dig a little deeper um, into your climate. Okay. And uh, this is a question from Justin Schott, who's director of our energy equity project in our School of uh, for Environment and Sustainability. Um, and he brought up this issue of climate fundamentalism. I don't know if you're familiar with that term, but it's the idea that large-scale solutions that I think we both often gravitate towards take precedence over equity and justice concerns. And certainly within C's and at the University of Michigan, we don't want to do anything that doesn't have a, a focus on justice. Um, but, we want to, but I'm worried, like he is, that we often gravitate, and I think even your colleague Bill Gates has been accused of this, mm -hmm. of gravitating towards the really big solutions, technological solutions. While grassroots communities typically operate at a scale um, and race, you know, where decarbonization isn't going to happen at the expense of people. Um, and he just wonders, you know, how is your approach and that of your partners uh, address this concern over climate fundamentalism? Well, <clears throat> I'd say our approach is very much about people and planet. And I think it probably goes without saying that you're only going to achieve the scale of climate transition that's necessary for our economies if the components of those transitional elements serve the interests of working families, of working communities, of real people around this country and around the world. And I'll give you an example. Our biggest single effort is called the Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet. Uh, it's a partnership we built with scientists and innovators and with companies uh, and with governments around the world to help bring renewable energy to communities that live in energy poverty. And most people don't realize it, but there are almost 800 million people that live consuming uh, less energy than it takes to power one light bulb and one small home appliance per person per year. Imagine what your life would be like without being able to turn the lights on in the morning you know, uh, or, or, or turn night. your computer or your phone <laughs> on, and certainly at night, exactly. <laughs> 
And uh, these folks worked with us for a decade to create renewable uh, mini grids, these, these sort of solar installations that have lithium ion batteries and remote artificial intelligence based battery management systems and smart meters that go out to homes in rural villages in India and Nigeria. And what we found is, at first they weren't working, they cost a lot, they were messy, they broke a lot. Over about a decade of program innovation, they actually work very effectively. And we can now deliver power at 15 to 20 cents a kilowatt hour to communities that don't have any other source of reliable, always on productive power. And when we do that, we find that people who are living in energy poverty start using electricity, they start paying for it. If you're in northern India, I visited a, a woman who, instead of uh, remaining poor, bought an electric sewing machine and started a small tailoring business and then started teaching other girls in that village and neighborhood how to be trained in doing the same thing. Visited a school that was uh, not open in the evenings for, for students and for girls in particular who unfortunately were held back from going to school. Now they have lights on at night. The girls, we visited classrooms packed with young girls eager to study. I mean, it's amazing what fighting climate can do for people. And the, uh, the opposition there is not, uh, it, it's not a theoretical thing. Like the only other source of energy they have is diesel generation. Diesel is hugely polluting, very loud, very noisy, and extremely expensive, yeah. 80 cents a kilowatt hour. So for them, it's a no-brainer. Those are the kinds of solutions for people and planet that we're investing our resources in. And frankly, by the way, when we do so, the leverage is amazing. We, we are rolling out three of those larger scale metro grids in Eastern Congo. For anyone here who's ever been to Eastern Congo, it's an it's a extraordinary place with extraordinary people that has been part of a conflict situation for decades that is horrific. Um, and I write about some of the kids I've met there in the book who were child soldiers or, or girls that had been through hell and back but were being rehabilitated. But for now, for the first time, those communities will have access to electricity. We closed a project that cost $80 million. We only had to put $8 million of our resources in. The rest came from investors and, and local funders and the World Bank and others. Uh, because the solutions work, and we're going to reach a few hundred thousand people initially, and then up to 7.1 million people with solar energy in that community for the first time. And it will transform life for those kids that I met in those settings. So, yeah, I agree. I don't know really what climate fundamentalism is, but I know that if we're going to succeed as a world at fighting climate change, the solutions have to work for people as much as for planet. And I think that's a great answer. I always, often say all people have to benefit from what yeah. we do. Um, and I think that's exactly what you're trying to and do. By the way, it's also true in, uh, in Puerto Rico, where we're, we're putting uh, solar mini grid back up into schools and critical care facilities. Most of the deaths that happened from the major hurricanes, like Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, were dialysis machines that went out and yeah. hospitals that lost energy access because infrastructure went down. That shouldn't have to happen. And, and we can green our economy in a way that actually serves our people if we are smart and thoughtful about it. Very cool. Another uh, person, uh, Tim Polk Polkowski, if I pronounce your name right, um, asked a question about something that keeps me up at night. Um, when I think of all of the emissions that we're making, I can think of, uh, of ways to reduce those emissions in many cases. Um, but we have a number of colleagues across campus, all across campus, including NCs, that are focused on sustainable agriculture. And one of the things that uh, they are thinking about uh, that worries me is the about a third of the emissions that we as a globe make come from agriculture and feeding ourselves. And one of the things that's made me very happy today is the opportunity to meet you, but also to talk about how we, as a university, can work with Rockefeller to maybe make some big bets. As a university, help you make your big bets. Um, and this would be an area where I think there's a lot of chance for thinking out of the box. But where are you now on, on agriculture? 
and what can be done to reduce agricultural emissions? Uh, well, we, we invest in agricultural sciences and innovations to help make agriculture, agricultural innovations more accessible broadly all around the world. And uh, our basic approach is ag the way we produce food has to change dramatically in the United States and around the world. You know, food, food is actually the leading cause of mortality and morbidity in the United States. The reason we lost so many people to COVID uh, was both bad early efforts to stand up diagnostic capability in this country and actually mount a public health response. But it was also because so many Americans have relatively unhealthy diets and were, had a lot of comorbidities and a lot of predilection to uh, bad outcomes due to obesity and heart disease and diabetes. And most of those illnesses can be addressed with better nutrition. Uh, but we have a food system that since the 70s has been monocrop focused, has increased calories per person consumed, has brought down the cost of a particular type of corn that is the basis for most of our food, processed food economy, and is laden in added fats and sugars. Around the world, we see the same thing as countries, even at far lower levels of income, are shifting to what, what they call Western food systems. So the reality is our foundation has worked in the United States on a major effort around food as medicine. Uh, where, where we're showing that actually putting diet front and center, even providing targeted healthy meals to pre-diabetic populations can reduce hemoglobin A1C levels and be an extraordinarily effective investment for self-insured employers and for large insurance companies who are looking to save on healthcare costs. By the way, we perform 130,000 uh, diabetic amputations in America every year. Think about that in this year. That's more than we've had in all the wars since Vietnam in terms of amputations. And it's because we simply don't help people get access to better diets and, and better care in that setting. So that's what we're doing in the US. Around the world, we focus a lot on regenerative agriculture and helping countries transition to types of agricultural production that are still very productive, even more productive, but, um, but have the ability to sequester emissions as opposed to release them at scale. And can I say one other thing? Because oh, today, yeah. at, I was at Michigan today, obviously, and I had a chance to sit with this group of lead scholars. Are there any of the lead scholars here? No, I don't. OK, maybe. They were great. And, they're, and a couple of them were interested in food security and you know, sustainable food production and agricultural sciences. And I just think that's great. I mean, these areas, whether it's energy security and energy technology, food security and food systems innovation, health and innovation. It is the great thing about a campus like Michigan is we should be able to nurture that sort of sense of wonder that comes with developing solutions to problems and then help these kids apply them to solving problems that really matter, like human nutrition, like hunger and poverty, and ultimately like climate change. Yeah, well, speaking of, of, that, of the students here, I'm wondering um, what exactly you had in mind. You, in the end of your book, there it is, right? <laughs> Free promo. Yeah. Um, you'll have the opportunity to buy this after the... No. <laughs> I, I actually really do recommend it. But you point out that you, know, you don't have to be wealthy or super connected uh, to place big bets. Um, and... Again, I w I'm wondering what you'd say to the students in the room about um, their ability to place big bets. What do they have to do to prepare to have the kind of impact that you've had? Well, to me, big bets start with betting on yourself. And you know, in my case, I grew up here in Detroit. Uh, you know, I was a kid, I write this in the book, I was a kid, it probably doesn't shock anybody, I'm from an Indian American family. Uh, and, and in this part, in, there's a part of Detroit where it's a very tight-knit Indian American community, and kids were largely told in that community that you know, if, you, if you can, you should be a doctor or an engineer. And somewhere along the way, my dad worked at Ford, so I wanted to be an engineer. Uh, and somewhere along the way, I said, I'll become a doctor. Uh, and then somewhere along the way, I got really interested in politics and public service. I did policy debate in high school. And, I don't know how many of you were here in the 80s, 
was it the 80s? Or, yeah, yeah, it was the late 80s, early 90s when Nelson Mandela came to, to Detroit. And, you know, Mandela was released after 27 years, and Detroit just didn't get visitors like that. And yeah. when he came, he went to the floor of an auto plant, I think the River Rouge plant. He went to Tiger Stadium a couple of years after we won the, the, the World Series. He was introduced by Stevie Wonder. Uh, it was like such a Motown moment. And he closed all of his speeches with, this, with the same exact phrase that day. And I was just sitting in my living room watching on TV. And he said, you know, to the people of Detroit, from the people of South Africa, I have a message for you. The message is, we respect you, we admire you, but above all, we love you. And I just sat in my living room and I was blown away. And I was like, gosh, I want to do anything that that he would consider worthy or worthwhile. Um, but I didn't know the path, and, and so I came to Michigan. I, the great thing about Michigan, if you're a student here at Michigan, is just explore, explore, explore. There are more than 100 clubs that work just on climate. There are probably 10 times that, you know, that cover the waterfront of issues you could be exposed to. Get active in student leadership and see what ultimately fits for you. What fit for me was when I was in med school, with a lot of courage provided by my then girlfriend, now wife, I left medical school and joined a presidential campaign. And it was just what I wanted to do. I wanted to try that. But it seemed crazy at the time, because uh, my dad told me it was crazy, uh, and because I was giving up a scholarship to go do that. But after taking the board exams, I sort of got in my car with my girlfriend. We drove 14 hours from Philly to Nashville, Tennessee. I landed at Al Gore's mom's best friend's pool house, where I lived for the next several months. Uh, and I was doing nothing productive. I was driving high school kids back and forth to the library, convincing political consultants not to smoke in my car. It was, it was low-grade contribution to American democracy. Uh, but then I got a job. I met some folks. Campaigns are fun because they're fast-moving, and they have to be meritocratic as a result. And, uh, and then we lost that campaign, for those of you that remember those days. We, here's a spoiler alert. We didn't actually lose from a voting <laughs> perspective, but long story. Anyway, but I found myself kind of without a job. And, and in that moment, uh, the Gates Foundation opportunity just emerged. A friend from the campaign said, oh, Bill and Melinda are looking for sort of an intern, sort of an economist, sort of a doctor, uh, nothing too serious. And I was like, hey, I think that's actually me. <laughs> Uh, and so I guess my lesson to, or, or the message I'd have for students here is whatever it is that gets you excited, whatever it is that you want to try to do, this is a campus where you have the opportunity to be exposed to professors like Peck who have, you know, world leaders who know everything there is to know. And, and it's a <laughs> place where you engage with other students where you can learn how to kind of become a leader on whatever it is you're excited to work on. And I would use those opportunities to get as smart as you can about something. You know, that was the, the lesson of the Gates thing was we spent years just studying the, the cost structure of vaccinating kids. And it was that study that led to some breakthrough innovations, the world's first social impact bond for financing vaccines, forward contracts called advanced market commitments for building a manufacturing base that was big enough to supply product to 100 million kids that are born every year. Uh, I go on and on, but it, I, I would say this is a campus community where I know you have a lot of opportunity. I would seize that opportunity to kind of learn and grow. You would seize it? Seize it. All right. <laughs> I love it. Well, you knew, I got to look at my watch. I can, um, you knew Al Gore. You won an election. You, he didn't get to go to the White House, though. Um, then you worked for President Obama, and you got to know him. When you first worked for Obama, I think just days after you became uh, the leader of the USAID, there was a big earthquake in Haiti, just days. And you were like all of a sudden charged with dealing with a humanitarian effort. Yeah. Um, what did you think of President Obama assigning that to you? Well, you know, when he called, so I had just started at USAID. I had just been sworn in that week. And, uh, and the earthquake happened around 5 o'clock at night, 5.12 p.m. And in a moment, you know, 21 of 22 ministries in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, collapsed. 
tragically, the United Nations, um, which was providing security in the country through a, a force called MINUSTA and was also providing services on a humanitarian basis, that building collapsed and a lot of UN leaders perished. And so we didn't really know what was happening when the president called. Uh, but I got a call. We had Blackberries then, and, the, and um, someone called the Blackberry, and my assistant picked it up and said, Raj, the White House says President Obama is going to call you. And I said, really? I didn't even know that's how it worked. <laughs> like, the president wasn't in the business of calling me. Uh, and so I was like, OK. And I looked at my phone. I had like one or two bars. And for those of you that have been in the Ronald Reagan building in Washington, they have brick walls like this thick. And I was like, oh my gosh, he's going to call and go to voicemail. So I, I found a window. I propped my phone up in the window. I took a little notepad out. <laughs> and then he called. And I'm like leaning against the window and trying to write. Uh, and he says, Raj, you know, this tragic earthquake happened in Haiti. And this is an opportunity for America to show the world what our power can do for moral good. Um, and I want you to make us proud. I'm putting you in charge of this. I want us to make, make us proud. And I said, absolutely, sir. And I was then ready to whatever else he was going to tell me to do, I wanted to write down. And the line went dead. And I was like, oh, no, I just hung up on the president. <laughs> and like 15 seconds later, I turned around, looked at the TV, and he was in the White House behind the press, you know, the press podium saying, I just spoke to Administrator Shaw, and I've directed him to deploy the Coast Guard and use every military <laughs> asset available and deploy the Comfort Hospital ship to help the people of Haiti in their time of need. So I was not really fully prepared for this. And, uh, were you just sta uh, standing? Like I was this? like, what am I supposed to do? He just called, but then he just <laughs> said all the stuff we're doing. Uh, and so the next morning, we had a briefing in the Oval Office. And I got there a little early, because you certainly would not want to be late. That's not a meeting you want to be late to. Uh, and I'd been up all night just working and collecting information and talking to people and building a team and all this stuff. I got there a little early. I walk in. They let me in the Oval. And the president and the vice president are over by the desk talking to each other. Biden staring out the window. Obama sort of saw me come in. And as I came in, uh, Vice President Biden was saying to President Obama, and he was very close to the president and very loud, and he said, uh, you know, are you sure about putting this Raj Shah guy in charge of this thing? This is, you know, he's 30-something. He just got here. Uh, we have this other guy, Craig Fugate, who ran FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, and who is a brilliant uh, leader and a great humanitarian. And Craig and Biden was right, had a lot more experience. Uh, so then Obama sees me, comes over, he's like, Raj, sit down. You know, and, and within moments, everybody piles in. We have a good, intense meeting. Uh, and on the way out, I grab Craig, and I'm like, Craig, I need your help. <laughs> I need your help. And, uh, and he's, like, he's like, I will do whatever you need. So we went back to USAID. The, the turnstiles, the, you know, the gates to get in the building, uh, you could unlock with a U.S. aid badge, but everyone else had to stand in this long security line. And by then, we had military folks and FEMA folks and HHS folks all just in this long line. Um, and, and Craig and I, we convinced the security team to just open those turnstiles, open the gates. And like during this crisis, we're going to need all the help we can get. Let's just take the risk, but let everybody in without badging in. And they did it. And Craig spent the next three weeks working out of our emergency operations in a great partnership. And ultimately, we were feeding 3 million people within days. We were distributing enough water so that diarrheal illness was lower six months after the earthquake than the day before the earthquake. We helped build transitional housing for hundreds of thousands of people. We you know, protected girls who were so vulnerable in that moment of tragedy and crisis with everything from lighting to security. And what I learned, though, was at times of crisis, people want to do the right thing. They want to be part of efforts that reflect our values. Uh, and it, it was amazing to me. You know, during that Haiti earthquake experience, more, more families gave directly to the Haiti earthquake response than watched the Super Bowl in 2010. And it tells me that the character of this country, our families and our people, is just awesome. And when people can trust that you're doing the right thing, when you're data-oriented about it, when you do it with a sense of partnership and a little spirit of American innovation, uh, we can do great things together. And uh, I'm forever grateful to Craig for that, for bailing me out in that moment. 
Uh, and forever grateful to Vice President Biden, now President Biden, who went on to become someone who really helped, uh, helped me out a lot. So that's the, that's the story of what it felt like in those first few days. <laughs> I don't know if we got the whole feeling, you know, but <laughs> I just is just being scared. I tell the I, <laughs> there I, you go. I was with these lead scholars today, and they're like, "Well, you write in the book about imposter syndrome, you know, like sitting in rooms and you're not quite sure you belong. Uh, how did you? How do you get over it?" And I had to think. I'm like, "Oh, I don't know how you get over. I mean, you certainly feel that way time to time." Uh, and my advice to them, my advice to students here, would just be, you know, when you have the chance to contribute when you're at the table, in whatever setting that is, trust yourself. Take that opportunity. You belong there. By the way, especially if you're a Michigan alum. You're, I was going to say, uh, all Obama had to say to Biden was, don't went, worry, go he's a Wolverine. We got this. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You did it. And, and I'm supposed to wrap up now. But I want a simple yes or no. Have you ever thought of running for president? Uh, you're not going to get a simple yes or no. <laughs> but I love public service, and I respect people who do it. And having seen it up close, uh, I'll tell you, we have this image of our leaders. People, young people don't trust Congress. You don't trust our electeds. Most folks are good people trying to do their best with the right intentions. And the stuff you see on television, especially cable news, is sort of the, the worst part of it. But if you can tune that out, uh, there are a lot of folks and a lot of folks out of this Michigan community that should be in public service, and, and that's the only way we'll keep our country great. So, so thank you. Well, excellent. I just want to thank you again for doing this with us. Uh, I think you're probably the person, I, if, of all the people I've met, the one who has done more to help other people. And I want to personally thank you, but I think we all want to thank you. I'm going to give you another plug for this book. I, I really started reading it, and you know, you, you see books like this in airports and stuff, and sometimes uh, you don't finish them. But this book really sucks you in, and I think it's especially uh, powerful for giving you clues on how to really make a difference. And I want to encourage everyone to read this book, um, and we're going to have an opportunity for book signing yeah. right after this. And, uh, if you're going to ask for your book to be signed, I'm told, please stay in your seats. And uh, partners at, oh, it's always about partners, at the Literary book st uh, Bookstore will um, help you figure out how to get your book signed. Um, and with that, um, I just want to thank you one more time, Raj. And I think I look, I speak for everyone at Michigan. We look forward to working with Rockefeller and helping you place more big bets and make this world a better place. Thank you again. Go Blue. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you everyone for coming and braving our winter. And we remember, as people who grew up in Michigan, there used to be more snow. So, <laughs> so love it while you can. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you. This is yeah, great. Was good. I really appreciate it.